I just heard somebody I really respect. I forget. I saw this quote from them. They said that the, the influencers are who are going to rise the most in the coming years are going to be curators. And I think that's what's fascinating with how much noise there is. There's a whole model on YouTube of faceless channels and automated channels yeah. and channels that yeah. remix kind of other people's content via fair use. So it just this is sort of like a platter of things to choose from. If you're going to stack the deck in your favor, you're going to assess it what's this is a, a powerful point that's only I'm emphasizing lately is I think I've probably said too much ignore the competition. You know, comparison is the thief of joy. All true. Ignore the competition. Don't compare yourself. Just be you, you know, and be yourself and follow your passion and like you can win. Whereas the truth is, though, you actually should study the competition. Yeah. You you should do competitor analysis because, again, every battle's won before it's even fought. Why would you take all of your forces and just run them into a trap where they're just all going to be slaughtered? Yeah. Instead, you just go over to Blue Ocean. You go over to maybe some area that's a little bit more uncontested. And one other aspect of figuring out you know, geography, gender, age, whatever, d- different demographics, psychographics, niche down your thing, pick something, is, is also just the TAM, the total addressable market itself. I think where things get – that goes back to consumption's higher than ever before. You know – Tech, for example, Think Media has 2.2 million subscribers. But I looked a while back at the Canon M50, a little bit outdated now, even the Mark II. But what a camera. For content creators, that was like the camera. Now it's the Sony ZV-E10. Price point features. There's certain cameras that yeah. just have mystique and magic around them. I have that camera. It's a great little camera. It's a great little camera. Yeah. And and for content creators, it was the M50. The ZV-1 is another one. What, what was interesting about the M50, though, is if you went and studied how many tech YouTubers or people talking about cameras pulled 8,000, 16,000, 58,000, 150,000 views talking about the M50. We're talking about thousands of videos. Like the total addressable market of interest in that camera, people talking about that camera, and how many angles you could have around the camera, best lenses, cinematography hacks, filmmaking hacks. Is it still relevant in 2017? Mm -hmm. Is it still relevant in 2018? Like, Every year, is it still relevant in 2023? It would mm-hmm. be actually probably a pretty hot video because there's still interest around it. And so, of course, at some point, there's levels of saturation. But when the TAM, the total addressable market, is big enough, not everyone's going to be MKBHD, of course. But the long tail of opportunity, it depends on what are people's ambitions. We are bullish at Think Media that the opportunity for people to create $35,000 a year from a YouTube channel in a competitive niche, 58,000, or go on to build a six or seven figure, you know, channel. Like the long tail all the way down to making an extra $15,000 a year and having fun and writing off your hobbies now because you're creating content around them and and keeping your job or going more part-time at your job. I still think the opportunity is unlimited. It's about getting kind of a clear perspective, I think, on the battlefield, on maybe how big the opportunity is, on how the YouTube algorithm works. And that's why we are so excited about the opportunity on YouTube. It's real, but it's we try to never sell. It's not get rich quick, <laughs> yeah. nor is it even, you might not even get rich. Like let's redefine that term. But yeah. but if you are really interested and in potentially, instead of making, as Gary Vee always talks about, right? Maybe you leave your 80K a year job and you make 58, but you don't have to, a commute, yeah. you, you live at home. That this is super real in 2023, beyond real. It's cra- it's still. I almost feel like it's still actually wide open. Yeah. If you can have the right approach. Yeah. Cosine a thousand percent. Let me just add a couple of things again that I heard you say, because I well I'm getting in your head a little bit because I consume your content constantly. So I, you know, I've watched the thousand other videos to be able to extract what I'm about to say, which is we've also um, not really talked about or defined. MVA or MVP, right? Which is that minimum viable product or minimum viable audience in this case. Yes. And um, this is an important, I think, acronym and calculation too. You alluded to it early, but sort of subtle. Um, you, if you have a, uh, you know, a law office, you're an accountancy or you're a financial planner or whatever, and it's and it's B to B or even D to C. You may not need that many clients. In fact, your capacity might be 10. Like, yes. That's all you can take. And so you're right. You don't need a million subscribers on YouTube to crack that nut. 
You just need the right amount. So what is that minimum viable audience? Like what, how many people need to see it then for it to yield a certain amount of leads or interest that funnels into your, your pool. And then you can, you know, do your business, whether that's your $58,000 a year goal or $558,000, you know, agency goal. It's super important. I'm glad that you mentioned that. Um, the other thing that I heard was this sort of secret formula to monetization, which, you know, everyone probably understands AdSense at this point. If you don't go back and watch a hundred of Sean's earlier <laughs> videos on the Think Media channel about how to do this, but you talk about uh, a camera like that little Sony. Now I'm guessing part of the strategy behind that is one, it's a pretty inexpensive camera. If, if I remember correctly, it's under a thousand bucks. Yeah, it might, the body might be 800 or 750. So that, there's a strategy behind that too, which is probably, I'm guessing, that instead of having to go out and buy like a Canon um, R5, which is like a three to $5,000 camera, yeah. which may, you know, if you have an affiliate link in there, is a little tougher to click or less people will, you know, the TAM, the TAM on that is lower. Totally versus the little under thousand dollars Sony. So if, and again, it depends what your business play is. If it's like, I want to have some of that go to affiliate, but I also want the, the ride the wave of the popularity of the other things to get the views and the interest and maybe get more people to subscribe. You're sort of, you've got several streams of revenue happening at the same time. That's also a very smart play. So if, if I was back into that or strategically reverse engineer yeah. what, your, what your strategy is, it's like, You've got to pick an affiliate product that you know uh, is going to ring the bell of your audience, one, right? So yep. if your audience is beginners, you can't start with this, you know, um, gigantic camera that costs, you know, let's say it's a, a red something or other, and it's a $50,000 camera. That's not going to work. Totally. Uh, and you also want to ride the wave of popularity. You talk about the long tail, if I could just maybe expand and define what that is like you're hoping that that's going to continue to last from 2017 to 18 19 20 here we are 2023 it's still got legs yep and you're riding that wave for as long as you can mm -hmm. yeah what Absolutely. did i miss break that no no you know this one of the ideas which i would love a viewer to steal they probably take a little bit of passion a little bit of experience but you mentioned picking an affiliate program too for example that um is lucrative enough that the math works out. So even if we're just breaking that down to the, to the long tail, like one channel that I think there are some, but that would be amazing is talking about new tropics. People talk about what alpha brain, but this is a big industry qualia mind, you know, you're in orange County. It's kind of definitely trending out there. Biohacking. Well, and, and this goes back to, they would say it would be, it's just as relevant today. The three big online niches, the best ones ever are health relationships and money. And everybody should also tie their content into those in some way. Like no matter what you do, if it can improve your health, no matter what you do, if it can help you make more money or save money, and no matter what you do, if it actually makes your relationships better, that's benefit extension. I'm kind of spinning off. But thinking about that, so nootropics and understanding that a bottle of this stuff can cost $100, $200, and the affiliate programs can pay you 30 to 50%. You're just judging the opportunity. You're like, if I educate on this, I'm obsessed with this. And these are one of the things where I... Like any entrepreneur, I have 48 business ideas and I'm like, I need to stay focused on Think Media, but the next channel I would start would be all on biohacking or whatever. Sure. But even more specifically, I just recently got into PEMF mats, pulse electromagnetic therapy. And, uh, for, and uh, I not just because of some health stuff, but also because of even just longevity and performance boosting in general. Yeah. We just did the Hyperice story. Okay. And that's sort of in that same, yeah. you know, recovery zone. Recovery zone. Yeah. So PEMF, you know, Tony Robbins kind of popularized the um, Hugo, which was a blanket on top of you and it kind of electrocutes your whole body. It mm -hmm. turns your cells from, they would say, raisins into grapes, recharges your cells. He would do it every day. He speaks. That's a, the, the cheaper version of that's like 8K. The expensive version is like 25K. That's older technology. I discovered this guy, Dr. Pollock. He's the position is the number one expert on PEMF therapy. Now I've purchased outrageously expensive devices and I've been testing different ones. And of course, I'm always asking in my mind, do they have an affiliate program? Sure enough, they do. And I've, I've maybe positioning to put some content out about this, but here's what is fascinating is whenever I tap into a niche, talk about long tail, this is, that would be a very niche type of product 
within biohacking overall, which is large enough. Um, I am shocked by the under, the, by the lack of content about that one thing. Yeah. It's not huge. Many listeners probably wouldn't even know they're not searching for it, but enough are. There is there is quite a bit of interest. Tony Robbins' new book, Life Force, maybe popularized it. Yeah. I'm talking to my friend, Ben Azadi. There's the higher dose ones. There's the lower wave ones. There's yeah. the higher ones. Are you looking for white space? Yep. And, yeah. and, and we're, it's 2023, and I'm like, that's in and of itself. Could You could either have a channel devoted just to those things, or I think what I recommend is you go, I know we say niche down, but you go broader on the channel, niche on the videos. So you make a channel that's maybe about biohacking. Now your first 100 videos might be on all PEMF because once people start discovering you, they're in a mindset of probably recovery, sports recovery, something to do with pain, something. And therefore, if they subscribe, they're probably not going to be upset if you're also helping them get better sleep and some other things. And you might not branch out, probably you shouldn't. But if you created a brand called, you know, health hacks, yeah. whatever, then you're you can have niche videos with a wider category of the brand. So that's just another example of Well, you're describing Andrew Huberman. Oh uh, yeah. Right? I mean, neuroscience. Yes. Talking about specific, you know, from hormones to uh, supplements and then to uh, hacking your health, your I mean your sleep and then Which is kind of proof and when you're doing market research. Those are the types of, and Tim Ferriss would teach this years ago, right? Who are who are like the other people that your ideal audience may be following as right. well? And so if Huberman now has millions of subscribers, I believe, and so you start realizing, okay, there, and of course, Rogan and biohacking, it's kind of more mainstream, but so burge, such a, you know, an industry that's growing, new things are showing up in the market. Some things ha are mature, but they're even, so this is where it gets me excited. You got to find your, and I, that what I would not promise somebody that wants to start a YouTube channel is you can't, I feel so much tension from our audience on this. Some people say, but, but I want, you know, I want to follow my passion. Whatever happened though, to like making videos you love, as opposed to just picking something that has business viability. And I, I've learned that novice entrepreneurs kind of lean a little bit more towards just doing what they feel like and experienced entrepreneurs, they lean towards viability. Technically it should be both. It yeah. should be like, what are you passionate about that there's also viability? Because you, it's cool if you wanna be passionate about it, you could start a channel about whatever, but don't come you know, email me in a year or two when it doesn't work. Yeah. Well, that goes back to the what's it for. Yeah. So you know, if, if your what's it for is to like have a place to rant or vent or you know, listen to your voice, that totally works. It's, you know, mission accomplished. Yes. Right? Awesome. But like if you need it to generate revenue or you need it to generate leads or even lead to something, then like you say, it's got to be a little deeper, more strategic thinking. Yep. 100%. Yeah. Okay. Uh, maybe coming around third, uh, headed home. What are the little things we can do? I mean... There's so much information out there. I feel like I'm a little bit, um, I don't know. I, I feel like I know what to do. Let me play, let me play, you know, the devil's advocate here. So I know what to do. I've read the YouTube playbook back and forth. Um, I know that thumbnails are important. Titles and tags are important. Maybe tags less so these days, maybe titles more thumbnails more. Yeah. What are the little things? that make a big difference that I may, I may not be doing the, I mean, not Brian, but you know, yeah, the, um, a few tactics, the, the most important highest lever for success on YouTube, the most important thing for success on YouTube is the videos themselves. Right. In fact, videos are more important and views are more important than subscribers. There's a lot of highly subscribed channels that have low views. YouTube is judging video content above all else. So we could come back to that because I would like to speak to that. But as far as some like rapid fire tactics, 99% of creators are missing out on the opportunity to use their community tab. Nobody mm -hmm. uses the community tab. We grew 1,500 new subscribers in 90 days just from posting on the community tab. Wow. People listening to this don't even know what the community tab is. This is <laughs> yeah. So it's kind of like a Facebook feed yeah. and you can post polls there. You can post questions, text-based questions. You can promote your videos if you do it properly. Slide decks. You could do, yeah, like a carousel. And 
the cool thing about it is number one, it's clearly being sh shown to cold traffic because it led to new subscribers. It's not a place where you actually post videos. It's a place where you can promote videos. So I'd say, don't ignore the community tab. Once you also cross 10,000 subscribers, nobody's using YouTube stories and YouTube stories can also lead to subscribers and they are a way to promote one video in your library every seven days is a video sticker you can put on there. Um, you can also promote other channels and some people want to, we use it to promote people from Think Media to, hey, we also have the Think Media podcast channel. So that YouTube stories is an underutilized uh, feature. Um, I do think now the YouTube podcast feature, YouTube said you're going to have a promotion in podcast areas or some kind of Snickers. There's three, there's three ways stickers. There's three ways YouTube themselves have said they're going to actually be promoting content classified as a podcast, which the way you do that is you essentially just put videos in a, a playlist and then assign it to be a podcast. And eventually that's going to also be distributed on YouTube music, which is a play against Spotify and Apple. Right. So that's would be another tactical thing. Um, but however, you know, what it really comes down to is I do find that a lot of people are looking for the small activities, like even a tweak in the title, which actually it's a big deal and a tweak everywhere else. But what YouTube comes down to is click through rate and average view duration. And it's going to come down to the architecture of the content itself. We teach the perfect video recipe, which is the big idea, the hook, the content and the transition. And it starts with how good is the topic, a really good topic. Are people interested in it? It's big ideas, topic, title, thumbnail, hook. How great can that first opening 30 seconds be? Hooks can be as, they could be 10 seconds. They could be a couple minutes, but YouTube themselves give you a specific uh, window inside of your analytics that says how many people are still watching at 30 seconds. So before you get someone to minute three, you have to get them through the first 30 seconds. So if there's any part of your video you over-optimize in terms of thinking about what is said and what is seen, it's gonna be the opening 30 seconds. Then the content, be brief, be bright, be fun and be done. How can you just make it as, as, opt, you know, as entertaining, as holding the viewer's attention? How long does my video to be? It doesn't really matter. It's how long, you know, if it's an interesting conversation and people are bought in, then they'll stick with it, but it should, if it ever gets uninteresting, you should trim it out. So how can you trim the fluff and the content? And then finally, this would be another mistake I think people make is the transition. I didn't say the call to action. The ending, the best call to action you can have on YouTube is to another video. And as a marketer or business owner, yes. many people want to send people to their website or their email list or something else. But YouTube values time on platform and they want people to stay on the platform. So the best call to action is to get someone to start watching your video and then continue to watch videos on your channel. Yes. So if you can <laughs> agitate another problem at the end of the video, if you could say, so here's the thing, we just learned about the best camera for YouTube, but if you don't have good audio, camera doesn't even matter. In fact, audio is probably more important than the camera. So click mm -hmm. or tap the screen to check out our five best microphones in 2023 and then just end the video. And so either just ending quickly and trimming the fluff on the end or actually leading into another video. Tactically, I think having a pinned comment and also a clickable link above the fold in the description is another tactical thing not enough people are doing. Um, with the, emojis. With emojis. <laughs> yeah. And the pinned comment, that is your opportunity to send people to your website or send people to a brand deal or an affiliate link. But your other opportunity there is actually send people to another video. Yeah. A lot of people will go to the comment section. If you can have copy that interest, maybe they're getting bored. That's about the time they go to the comment section. They're watching, but they scroll away from the video. They're listening to the audio. They're going to read the comments. And if there's some text there that says, you know, like, if you love this, you know, or so, pointing them somewhere else, you actually might save the viewer from leaving if you could send them at least to another one of your videos. Underrated tactic for sure. I, I mean, sometimes I go to the comments kind of like an Amazon review yes. before I watch the video. Yeah. Because I want to see how people are reacting and and then I'll make a decision. Like I'll look at the title, maybe the thumbnail, I'll, I'll glance it, but I'll go right to the comments like an Amazon review. And if it's if it's there or if it's something pinned, then I'm likely to, to click that. That's Super underrated. I got Good one job. more for you. Yeah. Time codes and chapters. And I think these would just be, we're kind of going through a list of YouTube best practices. Now, what's wild about chapters, and this is the ability to go to your description. You start with zero colon zero zero. That lets, and then you create a list. And 
you've seen this maybe on other YouTube videos if you're listening to this. Sometimes you hover over the video and it, if it's a 10 part, 10 points, it'll say tip one, tip two, tip three. Or if it's a three hour video podcast, it'll actually granularly break down the topics, which is very helpful because the argument against them would be, oh, it's gonna hurt my average view duration because someone's just going to, instead of watching the whole video, they're gonna skip to the part they want. The argument for them is they probably were gonna bail on the video, but now they actually may stay because you are actually serving the viewer. And that's my thinking on them. And visually, it plots it on the on the cursor too, so you can see it on the player. Yeah, you can see it on the player, bits. and it brings up the text. There's also an expandable window that allows you to expand the chapters off to the right side. And it actually puts kind of like thumbnails next to each one, which was the clip of the video during each part. But while it doesn't seem that there is an exact direct correlation, I've seen it happen a couple times. We get around 3 million views um, a year from Google, not because I have a good website or a good blog, but just because YouTube is owned by Google, owned by Alphabet, and our videos rank on the first page of Google. And what you'll see is this feature called key moments. And there have been a few times where not only do I have a video ranking on the first page of Google, but the key moments are my chapters. Mm -hmm. And and this is particularly relevant for interview content, how to content and especially education content, which is really what we where we lean heavily to a lot of business owners, educators, coaches, course creators. But when I think about the channels, Miss Excel, I just uh, talked to her at Social Media Marketing where she's teaching Excel. And so when you're there's people teaching coding and all kinds of things, these types of things really lend themselves. Maybe you're talking talking about how to build a car anything their stages or steps to. And what's wild is someone goes to Google wanting to know one particular question that probably exists inside of a larger conversation. A 30 minute video, yeah. Exactly, so if you're optimizing, this also might be super stressful to the listener because they're like, man, it sounds like a lot of work. Yes, but what is it worth to you to make a very structured thought through video that you upload on YouTube that you optimize properly and you put in the effort for these time codes and chapters that then earns you money and grows your channel for the next five years. And when someone goes to Google wondering how to specifically take the dash off of a Honda Accord 2005 and the exact moment of the video where you show them how to do that is being recommended on Google. And then when all of a sudden a new Fast and the Furious comes out that happens to rebuild the 2500 cord and drop a V12 in it, whatever. The different things can happen where either it's slow and steady or just weird aspects of your video library yeah. leads to tons of traffic, tons of awareness. And then again, that could be one pain point that people find you for, but to the point of business model, which it could be, you know, accessory car park company wants to sponsor you or you talk about how to make money flipping parts from junkyards on eBay in a course, and that leads people into that. Like, so you have all these other ways you could be earning money in the creator economy and monetizing. And then when you have content like this optimized properly, you've you've done your due diligence to not skip the pin comment, uh, you know, description optimized, time codes, chapters, and of course, good videos like all that all those little tactics aren't really going to matter if you're lazy on the video side um but they can they're the difference maker they're that extra icing on the cake that can help you capture a lot of the traffic coming your way so that it doesn't slip through the cracks and and just I figure if it's a best practice why not learn it why not implement it sort of a capstone like final advice uh, and let's assume that people are stuck yeah you know in this analysis paralysis you know I think I know what I want to do, but I haven't pulled the trigger yet. Yeah. Final advice to those people. Yeah. I mean, I, I heard it said that success is 20% tactics and strategy and 80% mindset. So if you're feeling stuck, you're feeling overwhelmed, you worry what other people are going to think, you're stuck in your own head. The first thing is know that you're in great company. Like that is how basically everybody feels or has felt. Um, the emotions of just self-doubt um, or overwhelmed by, by also just thinking, you know, does anybody even care? Will anybody care about my content? And you're just like, I see you, like we see you, we hear you. And 
anybody you look up to or respect or somebody that has started, chances are they've probably experienced those same things. And what they did was they just had to eat the frog. They had to just punch fear in the face, punch perfectionism in the face and start. Um, what I've learned is you cannot steer a parked car. And so if you're listening to this, what I would challenge you to do is actually grab your phone and shoot a video and upload it in the next 24 hours. The thing is that that action itself could be a pattern interrupt because maybe you've been listening to podcasts, watching training videos, maybe you're even watching web classes, or maybe you even bought online courses or stuff. But if you still haven't done anything, you got to break the pattern and you just got to do something. And I think that the opportunity there is, oh, but what if somebody sees that video? Here's the good, good news. If it's your first video, there is no one there yet. <laughs> and you can always make the video private or unlisted. I highly encourage you never delete it because it's part of your story. But, you know, my first video videos, like I often play my first video. But what people don't understand is like my first videos didn't make it to the internet. They're, they're the ones that are stuck back in that youth group. And so the level of practice and mistakes and being awkward or being boring or being like, I've done it all. Like I've done it all at a multiple that is far exceeds everybody. Like I literally have probably created now 3,000, 4,000 videos, 2,000 on the internet, not ca counting my client work. And so there's just a level of volume and repetition Everybody, if you ever try a new sport, you suck at first. As a snowboarder, I remember taking lessons and it was very painful on my tailbone. A lot of, bru you know, mm -hmm. painful on my whole body. You're falling. It's hard to carve. You don't know what you're doing, but you just have to keep showing up to the mountain. If you're trying to learn uh, a new sport or you're trying to go to the gym, it sucks. You're sore at first. You feel really judged. People probably don't care, but maybe they do. But who cares what people think? You got to just keep showing up to the gym. And so I would encourage people to get in the game. And sometimes the best way to start video is actually not YouTube because YouTube is a little more intimidating than maybe just the Instagram account you already have. Post on your Instagram stories. It expires within 24 hours. Talk to the camera, put the phone up, hit the thing and be like, hey guys, uh, I don't know what to say. This is weird. And you put it out there and that will disappear. That's really cool. And, and the cool thing about YouTube is there is YouTube shorts now. So YouTube shorts could be your first couple of videos. So you do have to, it might sound like cliche advice, but you like have to start before you're ready. You have to start poop your pants scared. You have to just punch fear in the face and, and make a lot of bad videos before you get to the good ones. And if you can learn while doing, I think that the biggest mistake people make is they subscribe to behind the brand. They order the books and they read them. They listen to the audiobooks and they listen to the podcast, but information comes in with no action. It's both. I also think that some people go to the extreme, like you don't need that. You just need to go take action. I just think it's both. I think that you should be studying and learning while you're also putting stuff out. And what I've learned is that when I post some videos and then I go study marketing more, I go, oh, wow, that those are the mistakes I just made in that video over there. And you now have something to evaluate. You have 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 YouTube videos. And then you watch another thick media tutorial and you go, oh, wow, like my openings have been dull and boring and my hooks have not been very good. But but if you can create the mindset that that believes this is huge for me and I've had I've lived by this, failure, failures are the stepping stones to success. John Maxwell said, sometimes you win, sometimes you learn. So if you have a growth mindset that's just that's that that's embracing videos that suck, realizing they're all education. They're every every time it's a practice. Mm -hmm. it's, it's it's a practice and an opportunity. And if we circle all the way back to the niche question earlier, this might sound daunting, but Steve Jobs said that business is a game of attrition. He goes, I just believed that if we just stayed in business, year six, year seven, year eight, your competitors are gone. Just people don't last, even if they were very successful. This this is kind of a dark way to end, but like even the creator economy itself is a notorious place of burnout and very successful creators have been burning out. That's why we're trying to approach things different. Our theme is built to last right now. Last year is at our best. We're focusing a lot on health and a sustainable pace. All that to say is I just hope the encouraging part is that if you're listening to this, if you get in the game, stay in the game, get coaching in the game, don't leave the game. Keep learning, keep leveling up. Your breakthrough moment, It for many, like we were talking about, you're, you were sitting down with, 
Gary Vee and Mari Smith and Lewis Howes 14 years ago. <laughs> like, and you probably, there's a lot of people 14 years ago that are gone. Yeah. And, and actually every year since then that have came and went, that maybe had a lot of funding, that maybe had six figures, seven figures of funding and people behind them, maybe they had everything going from them. John Maxwell wrote a book called Talent Is Not Enough. Talent, somebody might be more talented. I guarantee you, you're listening to this. There's, oh, there's other people more talented me, than me on YouTube for sure. Yeah. But hustle beats talent when talent doesn't hustle. And so if you get in the game, start posting content, stay in it, keep learning, and just have that resilience, I am, I am certain of this. There is a piece of the pie for you. The pie is way bigger than you think. It's not even a fixed pie. Like the world's a lot more abundant than you think. So if you get in the game, Am I guaranteeing you'll be a YouTube millionaire? Yeah, no, probably not. But am I guaranteeing that you actually could make this a, a side income, quit your job, do this full time, figure out a way to get your piece of the creator economy? The opportunity is more real than anyone even realizes. It continues to grow. The next 10 years are going to be the best 10 years on YouTube, maybe longer, but we could see that far for sure. The, the market share and the juggernaut positioning that YouTube and Google has you know, the lead time they have on the content library, the, the data just came out that um, more time is spent on YouTube in the living rooms of American families than Hulu and Netflix and HBO Max and the other platforms. That's crazy. YouTube got the Sunday ticket. So the YouTube brand, it just continues to grow and the future is very clear in the short, near and long term. So what are you waiting for? The thing is that you could get on for free, use your smartphone and scale up as you go. And uh, I think the biggest risk is doing nothing. I think it's time to punch fear in the face, punch perfectionism in the face and press record.